Hello, Wargamers, and welcome back to Purple Druid Presents Wargame Culture. Today, we are starting off with a new feature that uh, I uh, think we'll be calling Chainmail Culture. Uh, what we're going to do is interview a series of guests about how they learned about Chainmail, the miniatures game, and find out what they know, what they like, what they don't like, and what they're going to do. Tonight's guest is Taylor from Clerics Wear Ringmail. He has a podcast, a YouTube channel, and a blog. Uh, Taylor, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, sir, for having me on. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit first about uh, Clerics Wear Ringmail. Um, you know, what, what is it that you're doing in that space, and what, uh, what, are, what are your maybe your goals? Clerics wear ringmail. So the the name derives from getting back into uh, gaming uh, after having moved out of my traditional space. So I played. I've been a part of the war game hobby since the early '90s. Uh, a friend of mine who was trying to teach me how to play Magic: The Gathering took me down to a hobby shop at the. Uh, where, where they would pick pick up the cards and, and draft on Fridays. And I saw chainmail miniatures. I saw Warhammer miniatures. I saw somebody playing Battletech. And that uh that hooked me up. I was uh I was into it. <clears throat> also, I figured out that magic invalidates the cards every season or so. And I'm like, you know what? I can't afford Magic the Gathering. I need to move into something uh more sustainable, like Warhammer. <laughs> And uh, so, I started. I started playing uh, my f uh, my first my first miniature was a Warhammer 40k corn uh, uh, war warlord. Uh, what was it? Chaos Lord? That's what they were called. No, oh, it's been it's been forever. Um, I have in laws that are younger than that miniature. And uh, so it's been, I don't fault myself for forgetting what he was, <laughs> but that was my first miniature and I was hooked from that point going forward. And uh, so, okay. yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, uh, I have a similar story where I, I fell into the, the miniatures business hard. And I also gave up on magic the gathering because I couldn't afford both hobbies. Uh, mm -hmm. Could only, could only uh, support one. And that you know that's that old joke, right? When your children are young, <laughs> introduce them to miniatures, and they'll never have money for drugs. <laughs> yeah, very true. So, yeah. all right. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for uh, taking part in this research project that I've been working on for a while now. The, the chainmail game is a fast and furious miniatures game created by Gary Gygax and Jeff Perrin and Dungeons and Dragons is a supplement to Chainmail. A lot of people get that mixed up in the uh, in the origins and in the history and they think that Chainmail was the combat system you're supposed to use for the old original Dungeons and Dragons but actually Dungeons and Dragons is the role playing system that you use with the Chainmail miniatures game. And so I've been doing a ton of research, and I have decided that there are quite a few people out there that are interested in this, that know about this, and actually play the game. So I'm going to go around and ask you guys some questions. Uh, I've got a set of eight questions. I'm going to ask them of you, as well as some of the other folks uh, in the community. And I think we should just go ahead and get right down to it. How did you discover slash find out about Chainmail, the miniatures game? I found out about Chainmail the Miniatures game in the uh, reversed manner that uh, you mentioned. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned that when I was a kid, I found the uh, Chainmail Miniatures uh, at my uh, local friendly gaming shop. 
it was more of a local gaming shop. I don't know how friendly it was, but it was a local gaming shop nonetheless. And they had those old TSR produced miniatures. And I remember thinking, what are these even for? Uh, I guess people are using them to play role playing games, but uh, the only the only games people I know are playing around here are the these Warham the Warhammer uh, type games. The uh, the yeah, that was pretty much it. There was a big GW shop back then, but that's okay. And so for me, I knew the miniatures existed, but I didn't know what the game was about behind them. And so fast forward uh, into uh, into the college where I really got heavy into Dungeons and Dragons, and my my buddies and I played a lot of third edition, which in and of itself it's not uh, as and I'm I'm my primary audience is the the old school Renaissance kind of audience and. Third edition kind of anathema <laughs> to that mind to that to that mindset, but half of its attitude. And we were playing it. We were playing it to go into the dungeons. We were playing it to build those armies and to conquer that that space around us. And then during that time per- period, Wizards of the Coast re-released a third edition reboot of Chainmail, which would eventually turn into D and D minis, as I understand it, which operated principally off of a similar D20 mechanic to the third edition rule set. I bought a handful of miniatures there. We played a bunch of those miniatures. Some of my buddies repainted the WizKids or Wizards miniatures <laughs> that came in the booster packs. And uh, more power to them. They are much more talented than I am. Uh, and then uh, fast Fast forward again, once I got out of college, I was playing a lot. I, I moved away to do to get a job. I started playing online a little bit. And the seminal moment occurred when my twin little boys were born. And so I started reading about the origins of the D&D hobby. And that goes back into because uh, because my f- I played the, the the a lot of third edition, but my my first experience with the game was in was in second, and I'm like, okay, there's a second edition. That means there must be a first. So I looked into okay, what was that? And I found out about the the multiple product lines where you have the basic and the advanced, which uh, to, uh, n- all new to me at the time. And I started I got into a bunch of games online uh, and after the boys started sleeping through the night and I eventually worked my way back to the original, uh, the little Brown books, the, the ephemeral and the, um, enigmatic little brown books. And they can't, they had all of these references to chain mail and, and 30 year old Taylor brain made a click. He's like, okay, 10 year old Taylor brain saw all these miniatures, uh, back at the hobby shop. And 30-year-old Taylor is seeing this word in this game, so I'm going to find out what it is. And so I think at the time, you couldn't find it. I, I think there, this this might have been before Wizards had put the Chainmail PDF, PDF up for uh, sale on drive-thru. Might have been after, but regardless, I got a hold of a copy, and uh, I have a legitimate copy now, just to make sure. <laughs> I went back and I did purchase it as soon as I found out it was available. And the I read into this game and it was it was just it struck me. I'm like, this is awesome. This is what I had been looking for back in those two E uh days, back in that right in that beginning of the third edition days. And it expands on the horizon. It allows you to build it, it allows you to build up. You're not just your dude, you're your dude and this vanguard of other dudes who are kind of going out and cutting your way through uh, whatever obstacles you have. It seems interesting that, yeah, having uh, having children, which is <laughs> enormously time consuming, would uh, somehow free up some space in your brain to, to do some study like that. So what was it about the old chainmail game that made you want to learn how to play? I am a war gamer at heart. The biggest reason that I played as much D and D as I did is because D and D is cheaper than miniatures gaming. Once you have a handful, that's all you really need. And we have—I uh, have an old ch- uh, wet erase uh, battle mat. That's all you really need. And and it uh, chain learning to play chainmail, getting into the chainmail game, it gives me an opportunity to 
get back into a hobby that I don't get to play anymore. Um, but today, do you play Chainmail or any other miniatures games? Uh, and if you do, do you play them solo or with others? I have been <clears throat> I've been playing them by myself. Um, I have not been part of it. Part of it is because, like I said, there's there's a a lot of people will play the big games, the tournament games, and chainmail. I'm, I'm the only I, I've only met one other person uh, at where, that I is in my circles who knows what chainmail is. Great guy. He uh, has been running a continuous. Uh, AD and D first edition game for his family uh, since his kids were young, and he's he's recently now having to learn how to use the zooms and the virtual tabletops because one of his boys is in college. <laughs> um, but the uh, so I've I've been playing primarily by myself. Uh, it's a good way to learn the system and try to figure out what's going on, and I don't I don't have the same kind of obligation. So if I'm playing uh, by myself. I can put it down if, if one of the kids needs something. Yeah. Um, what scale minis do you use? Or do you not use minis? Do you just use counters or chits or index cards? L lately, I have been using um, markers. Oh, what are they called? The, a, a friend of mine on MeWe had posted a while back. There are these brick, there's these brick looking things that have like an X through them or a, a triangle in one of them that, d that determines infantry, artillery, cavalry. And that, so, and you move those around uh, to, as a sort of representative of what it was. Um, because I'm playing by myself and because I don't have a lot of space in the house right now, I've been playing with those using the tabletop simulator game. Uh, which I originally bought uh, with the intent to get all into it, but then I realized I'd, uh, 3D modeling is hard, <laughs> right? And so I'll I'll uh, suffice for a topo map. But so I've been doing a little bit of that. Um, I will admit I've pulled out some of my uh, old Warhammer stuff and played with that. So all of the real physical miniatures I own are 28 millimeter. Um, I do have some old Battlefleet Gothic stuff. Um, I'm not sure how much of it is still in one piece, and I don't know what scale that is. Because <laughs> allegedly, I don't, I don't it's, <clears throat> yeah, allegedly the the ship is supposed to be multiple kilometers across, and then it's a pinprick on the base that's a millimeter, and so it's that's a very intense scale. But chainmail. What I was hoping too was uh, to get into six millimeter. Because some uh, for the truly large scale battles, like if you're wanting to fight Waterloo or if you're wanting to wanting to fight Thermopylae, then you kind of need you. you uh, a lot of people will use a two millimeter scale, but two millimeter is a little small for me. My hand isn't steady enough to paint a uh, two millimeter, uh, or my brain isn't. Uh, focused enough to kind of make that abstraction at the zoomed in level uh, where with the six millimeter that's small enough that you can have you can field these huge armies uh i think war master was war master uh six millimeter but um uh, I, I think it's 10 10 or 12 it's 10, it's a, it's 10 a, or 12 i think it's a proprietary kind of, well it might be a proprietary size but i believe it it's very close to 10 okay Okay, cool. Yeah, it's been, I, I I remember looking into that, but then I kind of, I'm not sure why I kind of fell off. Who knows? It doesn't matter. The important part, six millimeter was attractive to me because it's just small enough that you can field these huge armies. And if you mess up because you're a bad painter like I am, people don't really notice because it's part of the bigger, um, the bigger scheme. And at the same time, it's uh, the tw it's 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 not so big that you have to it's you you can paint quickly. I was never good at speed painting, so if I had a tw if if I'm playing a 28 millimeter game, it's going to take me a couple days to get a get a squad of dudes done. Question number five: Do you incorporate chainmail mass battles into your fantasy role playing campaign, or not any kind of yet. mass battles? <laughs> not yet. Not now, yet. So the corollary to that is, why not? Leading up until this point, um, two primary impediments have gotten in the way of incorporating chain mail into the game. When I was in college, uh, I, like I mentioned, I didn't have 
the original chainmail. The chainmail we knew about was a stripped down D20. And although a friend of mine did try that, he put so a buddy of mine was uh, injured at work, and in his convalescence, he spent the entire time putting together this massive uh, campaign for us to play with our third edition group. Our f inaugural event for that campaign was a siege break where an invading army was going was trying to scale the walls we were playing from four or five in the afternoon until 9 a.m the following day and we had only gotten in four rounds <laughs> and so needless to say the uh that 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 uh, particular rule set isn't necessarily the most conducive to scale, um, but anyway, so I didn't have access to. I didn't have access to a compatible s scaled engagement, and then the second problem was um, interest. Uh, like like you mentioned, it's it's all about uh, recruiting. It's all about finding the right people. And most of the people I played with, they were interested in Warhammer type games. They were interested in playing uh, Mordheim, great game Mordheim. Uh, that that I was sad. That was the one that made me sad when Specialist Games kind of changed up. But um, I will I will stop uh, harping on Games Workshop. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're here to talk about TSR, but uh, the. <laughs> But so, but yeah. So my there was a there was a sort of de uh, delineation for for my friends. They, they it was either a role playing game or a war game. And the war games kind of we played some hex based campaigns. Those were fun. I think I, I was able to take part. In, we call them map games. One of them was hex based. One of them had like a region crawl. So you have like a risk board where different. there's a map underlying it. And then you kind of jigsaw areas that are connected to each other and then move your your group around in on the map. So irregular hexes. <laughs> So we we played the hex. So that was twice, and we we used a twenty eight millimeter scale for that. But that was always separate. That was always different. That was always outside the scale of our uh, campaign play. And I could never sell them on it. Uh, I, I wanted to get it in, and the group the grid just didn't click for them when they wanted to explore a character uh, in there in. And I'm going to get in trouble for saying this because because uh, I, I can see it now. My uh, my DMs filling up. We don't explore characters. We explore dungeons, and I agree with that. <laughs> and that's why that's why I'm harping on my other friends. Um, so they they wanted to be the hero. They wanted to have that kind of small scale squad level engagement. And if if we were jumping to do the bigger scale, the the pitched battles, that was just it, there was a disconnect that they didn't they didn't fit together, and so that's why I have not done it or had not done it to date. But where I'm going in the future, um, I'm look uh, is online. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the game online. Uh, I've had a couple friends who I'm going back who I had gone back and forth with. Oh man, it's, it's probably mid 2020 even. Uh, and though I haven't gotten to play with you guys, oh, it's it's coming one of these days. <laughs> But so what I'm the next big project for me is to try to get a uh, chainmail based uh, fantasy campaign going. And although you start out at level at level one, you're kind of a nobody. That's the beauty of those those old school games. Uh, when you equate treasure with advancement, you bring that treasure back. And what are you going to do with two thousand gold pieces? You've already bought your plate. Nope. What you do is you hire mercenaries. And what you do is you engage in these overland battles. You engage in kind of uh, warband tactics and then in domain tier uh, tactics. And it becomes a map game in and of itself. And fun fun factoid, in uh, you may, you may depending on your circles, run into different memes or jokes about 30 to 300 orcs. And that's because in the original... Uh, Little Brown books and into a first edition. Uh, I'm going to pop open my copy right here. This uh, 
if you run into kobolds in in the wilderness, you can run into up to four hundred kobolds, goblins and kobolds, uh, forty to four hundred number appearing. Play that in uh, fifth edition. <laughs> Tell me how long a uh, combat takes to run in with four hundred participants in fifth edition. Um, and the answer is, uh, for you, uh, it doesn't because you don't. It's that's not what it's built for. But if you're running the the old school game, if you're running a chainmail fantasy game, that forty to four hundred, that seems approachable. That's only a handful of miniatures. That's only a, uh, a handful of dice and um, a couple hours, uh, a couple hours of good fun getting getting that done. Yeah, definitely. Mass combat in your fantasy game you might find that it's easier than you think. And just coincidentally, I happened to run a, an adventure <clears throat> with my uh, one of my friends' groups as a proof of concept where they literally had an encounter with 168 orcs. And it was set up so that they could engage with these orcs. And they didn't, you know, they're, they, uh, they, they, Played it out and I made a little video about how I ran it and I actually did it over Discord voice and I just used index cards in front of me to track where the various units were going and they really liked it and it it went very seamlessly. Um, I kind of wish I, I want to do that again and record it so that people can see exactly what happens and the steps that are taken. Uh, the group I was playing with, because it was kind of a test thing, and they had never played with me before, um, they didn't want to record it and, and have it online. So uh, we, we, I will reproduce that experiment because it was very enlightening, and it went very quickly, and it it literally did not take up the whole session. So it was it was pretty cool. I'll put a link to that video down in the description. Yep, and I, I would watch it, uh, and that's. A talking about uh, people com talk talking about the divide between uh, war game and role playing game talking about trying to explore a heroic character how much more heroic can you be than riding your uh, riding your war horse up and down your line of spearmen before charging down the mountain how cool would it be if you were the one giving Theoden's speech as you're about to lead the Rohirrim against elephants? Uh, that's that's epic fantasy. So if you want you want to be the you want to be as heroic as you can be, you want to be as epic as you can be. Having these war game elements, having these mass battles, that's the next logical step. That's where the that's where the big the big dogs go in myth. And in legends, and that's somewhere you can go to if you have the right rule set. Absolutely, and we do have the right rule set, and we're talking about it today. And the great part is that we can bring it all back because there is this resurgence of interest in it, and especially if you go and pick up the uh, Secrets of Blackmore movie and give that a give that a gander. Uh, there's some really cool stuff in there because that's how they played the game. And like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, the original game was made as a role-playing supplement for the wargaming campaign. So that is taking us to our next question, which I believe, what do you like best about the Chainmail combat system, miniatures, miniature gaming battle system? Yeah, all things aside, I, I actually did think about, uh, I, I thought about these questions in advance of coming on, and this is the one I have the most notes on. Uh, and so uh, no fear, uh, audience, uh, me having more notes means I'm less likely to ramble. <laughs> You'll get out of this one with a concise answer. And I thought about this question from two avenues. First, from the RP side, but then second, from the war game side. From the RP side, it scratches an itch for me. Uh, there's a couple different pieces. One, you, there's the heroic fantasy that I talked about, and two, there is an it. There, it helps to better explain the hit point abstraction. So, if I'm playing chainmail and I put a hero down on the field, 
that hero is effectively immune to foot troops. You either have to have a lot of guys around me, or you have to have the precise weapon that goes through my armor, because I'm just going to wade through. You have um, Sir Gregor Clegane uh, bounce, uh, crashing into a, a mob of spearmen and then just exploding out of them like a, uh, a like a wrecking ball. Uh, scene from the only Game of Thrones book uh, I've actually read, <laughs> but it's a great analogy because he is very obviously fighting as multiple men and that's an aspect of the chainmail game and so it's not in every battle uh, that's in the fantasy supplement where you have these heroic and superheroic individuals but that scratches an itch for me for games uh for for some games you'll have the cumulative wounding effect uh, where you take a couple hits to go down before you do uh, for some games it makes you harder to wound and so you just have miss after miss after miss with chainmail it plays with like a dice pool you have the ebb and the flow and you have these uh you you have the numbers rise and fall and i think it's a good abstraction of the character's uh, skill, the character's heroic status. And that's that's what it stands out for me on the RP side, because Conan, if I'm playing Conan the Barbarian and my, uh, my Aquilonian knights have fallen around me and the Cothites are coming, are, are encircling, might have been the Nemedians. I've got uh, a particular story in mind, but uh, now I'm afraid to quote it because I'm going to feel silly for not remembering. <laughs> but that's a good representation for me uh, of that heroic stature. That's a good transition point for me to get into a sword and sorcery mindset. Uh, and then secondly, on the war game side, it is so fast. Now, think about skirmish games. Most of the skirmish games out there, you're going to have multiple consecutive rolls to determine an effect. So you may have to roll to hit a unit, you have to, may, to roll some damage for the unit, that unit may have a defensive roll, an armor save as it may be, and then you may have morale rolled on top of that. And so you have all of these rolls that happen in sequence of one another. And what does that do? That slows down play. Every time you throw dice and look at those dice to check the results, you have committed a, sec, uh, a section of the game to reading those results. The mass combat rules in Chainmail burn that down to a single roll. You have the number of dice is based on how many dudes you have, how you're armed, and how your enemy is armored. And, and you throw the dice once, you count your successes, and you're good, and you go. There is a factor of morale after the fact. Um, it, it looks intimidating on paper. It's not as intimidating as it seems, especially if you pre-calculate and then just modify it based on the casualties you take. But the, and, but the point is, once you have that down, it's built in a way that's much faster than a lot of these other games. And so you have, um, <clears throat> uh, think about template weapons. Uh, so if you're, you're you have a trebuchet that's full of uh, that's full of um, boulders and it's raining down on the uh, enemy troops, you have to figure out where it hits. You have to figure out what it does. With, with chainmail, it's a guess and go, and there's an optional rule to to scatter, but it's guess and go. And once you start hitting, it's okay. Did this unit get hit? they're out. These, these units get hit, they're out. And so it's brutal in that sense, but at the same time, it's so very fast. And you can play a game of chainmail with a lot of, with a lot more action on the table than you can a lot of modern skirmish games because it's abstracted, because it's uh, sleek in that regard. Um, maybe the design motif came from an era when people could not afford to have as many supplies as we do today. Um, people obviously still made money back then, but dice were more expensive. Paper was more expensive because the means of production were not as uh, mechanized, not as automated. And in a lot of, in a lot of ways these days, a lot of the stuff is manufactured in a 
uh, low low cost environment, which was not available back then. So there's the there's this cost aspect to it that's different. And so was that was that scarcity, and you you the the authors uh, of the chainmail game, uh, Gary in particular, he was a on on again off again. Uh, work uh, as a cobbler after he had left the insurance fund he had worked for. And so he didn't have a lot of money to play with. He had a family with like five kids to worry about. And so he didn't have a lot of money to play with. Was that scarcity, was that necessity, the origin of the leanness and the efficiency of the rule set? Maybe. I don't know. I would have to. Uh, I would have to meet up with some of the people who played it back in the day and ask. But in either case, the result is a game that plays very quickly and one that you can resolve huge engagements with, with plenty enough time to come back and have another. Right. Absolutely. And I think you've also done some coverage right there with question number seven how would you compare chainmail with other tabletop miniature gaming rules and yes i 100 percent have to agree with you it is fast it is brutal it does move very quickly uh in fact all of the test battles that i've done haven't lasted more than four turns uh admittedly they've been set up so they stick right in but at the same time <clears throat> i have Played Warhammer fantasy battle games all afternoon. <clears throat> so yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about there. Now Absolutely. the final question, I think, and at the risk of going over time, I'm going to go ahead and ask this question anyway. Number eight, for a creative person, does this chainmail miniatures game inspire you to create your own hack or your own miniature or game rule system? Why, yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks for coming. No. no okay, <laughs> we're good. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Cue the music. Yeah, so I, uh, in 2020, had been working on my, uh, my what, I, what I was calling my old school essentials of chainmail. So what I was trying to do was I was trying to, I read the, I read the book, I started playing with the system, and I was trying to take the rules as they were, reorganize them, reword them, and present them in a way that was easy to grok, easy to reference, easy to use. Because uh, Chainmail, it, it takes a couple read-throughs. Um, honestly, I get it a lot better now that I've printed it out. It's one of those books that I have a hard time reading on PDF. <laughs> I don't know if it's just my my attention span, but if I if I physically am holding a printed thing, it's easier for me to understand what what's in there. But um, so that um, I had called that ring mail after my name, and <laughs> and so that's uh, that's available on my blog. Though by the look of it, I have not touched that since 2021, and. What what is it what is it out there? Well, it's it's kind of at this point it's an unfinished state. Um, what I need to do is uh, I need to go back and kind of take the notes that I had made while playtesting it. I had a couple cool friends uh, in Discord land who had volunteered to run it on their own, which was absolutely fantastic. One, I was amazed that there were people out there who were interested enough to try uh, me, a total internet stranger, my interpretation of this classic game and then see how it ran. And so I got a lot of feedback from them. And uh, I have a, I'm only on ver a document version 0.1 and I, I already need to go to 2.0. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff that I need to change about that manuscript to make it work. And at the same time, I'm, I'm inspired, and so I got some. I got some folks playing again. I've got some real interest in it again, and I think I'm going to go back and try to uh, get back into trying to get that that uh, retro clone uh, done. I'm very grateful that you gave me the opportunity to ramble a little bit uh, about that tonight. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure, and I look forward to taking a look at what you put together. I'm very interested in it. I'm actually up to my hips right now in uh, Featherstone and Bath and all those old guys and their uh, approaches to the wargaming scene. Um, 
following in the footsteps of our fearless leader. So pretty excited about that. Uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experience with Chainmail with us. Uh, for those of you who are listening and are still here, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for being part of the conversation. Um, please leave comments down below. Let us know if you have any questions. Both of us will certainly be keeping an eye on the uh, comments area. And let's see what else is going on. We are also uh, planning on doing some more of these interviews as well as, uh, oh, I want to invite you, Taylor, to participate in the campaign carnival that'll be coming up later in June of 2022, which is where we are today. Um, the campaign carnival is a war game uh, carnival where I'm going to present some scenarios and people out in the community will actually go ahead and play these games and then just report back with a little paragraph on how the game went and uh, we'll generate some battle reports and I think it'll be a really cool thing and we'll put together um, a little booklet and let people uh, take part in this sort of round robin uh, tool for how to, uh, how to how to get a campaign off the ground. So this is like a little mini campaign to get people started. So once again, everybody, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Please do hit like and subscribe. We uh, look forward to seeing more of you in the future. And uh, Taylor, once again, good night. And thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me on. All right. Game on, everybody.